Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, I think we should um, make a start. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, Tobias. Um, who's uh, visiting us uh, today from Fraunhofer. He's been doing some very interesting work, in particular in uh, capacitive uh, sensing, and uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, proxemic interactions supported through these uh, different types of capacitive and electric field sensing techniques he's been developing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in case you have any questions, uh, just let me know during the talk, and I'll be happy to answer them. Um, so um, my talk is building up on a very famous paper by Saul Greenberg um, called Proxemic Interactions, uh, the new Ubicomp. And they start this uh, paper by giving a quote um, from Bill Buxton when he said, when you walk up to a computer, does the screensaver stop and the working windows reveal themselves? Does it even know if you're there? And um, that quote is from 1996. Um, so now there's uh, some time uh, has passed, um, and I think that uh, not many computers behave in that uh, reasonable manner. Um, but it gets even worse when we think of uh, everyday objects and uh, yeah, everyday home appliances uh, and humans. So um, when we design interactive systems uh, for these purposes, um, we face the challenge of environmental perception. And env environmental perception means um, that uh, we include both sensing human interactions and also sensing the environment. Um, these two goals um, have uh, a few requirements, um, which are, for example, to uh, embed hardware and also deployment constraints. So in that case, we have the Microsoft Band and the space which is available is very limited. Um, also, communication with other devices um, is crucial. Uh, nowadays, we mainly rely on having some smartphone coupled uh, to a smart appliance like uh, this oven or the scale. Um, but one would aim for having many interacting devices um, communicating to each other. And also, a very crucial point is uh, power consumption and supply. Uh, as in this smart mug, uh, which needs to be recharged uh, every few days um, yeah, to, to offer its functionalities. So, um, in terms of proxemic interactions, um, I, would ask, I would like to ask uh, the question on how a world could look like in which every object can perceive spatial relationships. And that means spatial relationships between persons and objects, objects and objects, and of course, persons and persons. So um, one of the, the case studies I did was uh, on a smart light. And um, this shows how when objects are perceived in a spatial manner, how interaction uh, can become a bit more magical. So in that case, uh, one can switch uh, the light on using uh, uh, a lighter and uh, filling the light uh, using different bottles. So now I'm not yet going into technology, but um, this is a bit to exemplify um, what I mean by uh, proxemic interactions. And um, you can use um, gestures, for example, carried out with this eraser uh, to switch the lamp off. Of course, uh, one might also might to want to uh, interact using smartphones. Um, or building up spatial relationships by um, yeah, touching two objects and then um, letting one object or two respond to that action. And one might also want to carry out certain gestures um, to make it more uh, convenient to use and perhaps not having to touch it. So there are many opportunities to uh, do sensing for environmental perception. Um, for example, infrared sensors, um, ultrasound sensors, 
um, accelerometers, which are usually attached to uh, the objects themselves. So uh, remote sensing is a bit difficult. Um, of course, cameras uh, offering a very large bandwidth of information, um, piezos, and uh, also capacitive sensing. So when using um, capacitive sensors, um, we have uh, a few great advantages um, to other sensing technologies. And these are, uh, for example, placements underneath of any kind of non-conductive material. So it makes it very unobtrusive to deploy those sensors. Also, there's uh, the low power consumption of capacitive sensors, um, which is very good, uh, for example, compared to ultrasound. Um, the detection distances which can be achieved are approximately uh, below 50 centimeters, um, but currently we also see a lot of capacitive sensing and touch sensing and uh, far uh, less uh, detection distances, for example, 10 centimeters. But that's uh, uh, possible to achieve that. So um, this is one example of uh, capacitive sensing, and um, it's uh, Leon Theremin um, playing a music instrument, um, which he built up on uh, capacitive sensing. And that was in uh, 1919. And uh, he's having two electrodes here and one electrode here. And uh, he controls pitch and volume using those two electrodes. And this kind of music was actually used for Star Trek. Um, yeah, but it's, it's very hard to play that instrument. And it does not only uh, rely on the distance of the hands, but it's more the whole body which has an influence too. Um, so that's uh, the thing that makes it also very hard to uh, control. Yeah, he later became a Russian agent um, and traveled around with his instrument. So, um, I would like to uh, dig a bit deeper into uh, capacitive sensing techniques, and um, I would like to present a little classification on capacitive sensing. So um, capacitive sensing is uh, usually based on uh, using electrodes uh, connected to a sensor, and these electrodes um, are applied to um, yeah, have an electric potential on them and then sense uh, the environment. So here, um, one can see such an electrode. Uh, it's just a singular one that builds up an electric field um, to an object um, within distance. So that could be, for example, a human hand or a human body. Um, this kind of mode is called uh, loading mode um, in proximity sensing terminology, um, but could also, or is often referred to as a self-capacitance measurement, um, which uh, is, for example, often conducted in capacitive touch buttons. Um, the second operating mode um, for capacitive sensing is uh, shunt mode. In this case, uh, one has a distinct transmit and receive electrode and um, an object uh, in distance um, will kind of interrupt this electric field and uh, change the capacitance between those two plates. This is also called uh, mutual, capacitance, uh, mutual capacitance sensing. And the last mode is um, transmit mode, where an electric potential is coupled to the human body and a receiver electrode um, is used to receive that kind of electric potential. This is also referred to as intrabody communication um, because the human body is used as, uh, as an electrode. Um, the work on capacitive sensing in human computer interaction um, started, uh, I think, with uh, Smith. And he uh, made his uh, PhD thesis about um, sensing the proximity to objects um, using uh, capacitive sensing arrays. So here you can see one example uh, to sense um, multiple hands. And uh, here he used a very flexible array of uh, capacitive sensors that are deployed on a table. Um, recent examples. Um, especially in industry, include uh, mobile phones and touch screens. And they tend to be uh, a bit more expressive um, right now by sensing also 3D interactions in front of them, as uh, in this example by Microsoft Research. 
An example for um, transmit mode sensing is um, diamond touch. And here um, a, a signal is coupled through uh, a chair onto a, a multi-touch table. And this makes it possible to distinct between multiple persons um, touching the surface. Um, so capacitive sensing is not only applicable in uh, touch screens and uh, touch-based interaction, but also in uh, sensing interactions in ubiquitous environments. In that case, uh, we have a smart doorknob here. And uh, by measuring the self-capacitance, one is able to distinct between uh, different types of touches on that doorknob. Um, it could also be used for measuring activities of daily living, as in this example, um, whether ele electrodes um, capturing muscle contractions or swelling activities. And this makes it possible to um, derive whether a person is eating or drinking something. Um, I'm structuring my talk um, focusing on uh, the five proxemic interaction dimensions presented by Greenberg. And these are distance, orientation, movement, identity, and location. And now I would like to dig a bit deeper into these dimensions um, and see how capacitive sensing can cover them. And the first dimension I would like to talk about is distance. And here my uh, first scientific contribution is a prototyping board for capacitive sensing. So this is the board. Uh, it's uh, basically a DSP processor um, inside, and uh, there are multiple electrodes which can be connected to that board. And uh, here you can see um, the sensors, and um, there are also different sensors that can be uh, combined for capacitive measurements. So as I said, um, there are these different operating modes, and this board's, board supports all of them. Um, yeah, making it possible to realize very flexible uh, electrode setups uh, and uh, capacitive setups. Um, we evaluated that board using a fake arm. In that case, that's an aluminum tube. Um, and the distance of the aluminum tube can be adjusted uh, using that wire here. And um, this is uh, the electrode and the sensor. And that way, we uh, conducted measurements on the sensing resolution in terms of uh, uh, distance. Is there any sense in which that aluminum tube is known to be roughly similar to an arm? Or yes. Did, did you yes. fill it with water or meat or something? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, actually, the uh, connectivity is very high. So it doesn't matter if you fill it with something. And um, yeah, we. We made experiments also by um, fixing an arm into that uh, kind of appliance and see if it behaves similar. And it actually does. Um, and yeah, also previous works have, have shown that it's very similar, but we wanted to check on that. Yeah, it's, it, it's, not, very, uh, uh, it's not very common to, to see that as an arm, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, it is. Um, so um, these are some of the results we obtained. And um, one can see that um, large electrodes um, have a very, very good resolution, also in distances of uh, 30 centimeters. Um, so that's an electrode of 10 by 10 centimeters. But when these electrodes go smaller, uh, the resolution also decreases. Um, we also um, investigated different materials for electrodes, um, which can be ITO, for example. Um, and ITO is often used in uh, capacitive touch screens. Um, P.PSS is a prototyping material, um, which can be inkjet printed and makes it very convenient to prototype. And it's also transparent. And um, yeah, P.PSS actually has uh, the worst performance because its connectivity is not very high. Um, so ITO is uh, somewhere in the middle there. But still, um, the electrode material is not that crucial because uh, the currents flowing in such a setup are very small. And uh, the connectivity of an electrode doesn't have uh, such a great influence. 
Um, so there was uh, loading mode sensing and for shunt mode sensing when we have two electrodes. Um, we can see that the resolution is not as high uh, as in loading mode sensing. Um, when having large electrodes, uh, we can cover greater distances, but the resolution is worse than having small electrodes uh, when sensing small distances. So um, that was a very interesting finding, I guess, and this intersection here is uh, the crucial one. Um, using that board, um, uh, that was uh, published as open source, um, somebody from San Francisco contacted me and he wanted to do an art installation with these uh, interactive wheels spinning around. And whenever you're at San Francisco Airport in Terminal 3, uh, you may want to check it out. Um, so that art installation um, was done first by prototyping using capacitive sensors and then I did um, develop uh, an own sensor uh, which can be connected to a programmable lo logic controller um, to steer these wheels and uh, steer the different lights. So these are actually uh, mechanical setups and uh, the sensing electrodes are deployed here around the wheels. Um, but it's still possible to detect uh, changes over here um, because uh, the plexiglass uh, is slightly conductive um, to make it uh, anti-static. So that's um, one of the prototyping examples I did. And another example when having a very high update rate um, of currently 100 hertz is uh, that one can do fall recognition, uh, for example, in elderly homes. And uh, you can see me uh, falling down onto that augmented carpet having eight electrodes. And um, yeah, this is the impact of my hand. And uh, when we go on, uh, you can see my whole body going down and uh, creating a very distinct measurement in that case. Why well, have you kind of done an accelerometer in the floor? Um, you could, of course, use an accelerometer. Uh, people have done. Um, but that still depends very much on the um, material of that floor. So in case you don't have uh, very large vibrations uh, when you have a very solid floor, uh, accelerometers might not behave that well. Um, but when you have, let's say, a wooden surface, um, accelerometers will be perfectly suitable for that. But still, I think that the um, uh, ambiguity you can observe with uh, accelerometers is, is very high. Uh, for example, when something drops down, or um, you, you don't cover an area like it is here. Um, generalizing on that, uh, one can also do uh, yeah, general purpose activity recognition. Um, and this is an example of a variable um, device. Uh, it's, it's called a hedgehog activity logger. And this one uh, actually uses uh, accelerometers um, to record activities of daily living. And we thought it would be good to equip um, this uh, sensor also with uh, capacitive sensing to sense the, di the distance um, to objects um, using that uh, wristband and an open cap sense sensor. So here's the electrode. And um, when having the wristband on, it can detect uh, the distance to nearby objects. And this is the hedgehog. So these are some examples um, where we see that uh, data provided by this modality is um, adding additional expressivity. In that case, um, this is an open door activity, and you can see that the wristband is approaching the door, then there's uh, the activity of moving through that door, and uh, the second approach to the doorknob, um, which is very similar actually to the first one. Um, another ex uh, exemplary activity is drinking, and here one can see that um, the um, hand is moving f away from the table um, to the mouth, and uh, yeah, one can uh, identify the number of nips someone takes. So 
In that case, uh, we could show that this uh, data can enhance uh, accelerometer-based activity recognition and provide an additional uh, mean for um, classifying general purpose activities. So <clears throat> the next two uh, interaction I would like to cover is orientation and movement. And uh, here I designed a method for recognizing objects in proximity to uh, capacitive sensors. So currently, uh, the state of the art was uh, that usually someone would have uh, just like a 3D location of an object. But my goal was to have it some bit more expressive uh, by adding uh, more dimensions to it for example, multiple objects, um, or also uh, different object representations, uh, which are here uh, provided by these boxes. So these boxes can also have a different width, for example, or a different height uh, to indicate whether somebody's grabbing something. And in this case, um, we have an interaction space above a capacitive sensing device, and these uh, volumetric models um, that um, kind of uh, give an impression of how hands or objects are located above that. And this model is called Swiss cheese. And um, I will explain now why it's called Swiss cheese. It's because um, the, this uh, model is based on elimination. So when making a capacitive measurement, one cannot say, okay, um, there's a hand located at a certain distance, but one can only say that there's no hand uh, located at a distance of X around me. That is uh, because uh, different objects have different uh, connectivities. Uh, one might also have different sizes. So in that case, one can only do a best or worst case assumption. And so that model uh, has those holes inside. And when combining multiple sensors now, one can eliminate the probability of object presence uh, at a certain location. So this would be uh, the first sensor. And it's telling me, OK, um, there might be something around me, but in that small space, I'm sure there's nothing. Um, when using other sensors right now, they might be able to tell, OK, here, there's a large area in which nothing may exist. And when combining all these sensor values, um, one has uh, a remaining part of cheese, which is located here at both sides. And um, this remaining part can be analyzed by fitting these volumetric objects in, um, as I told you. And here you can see um, these are some, some very probable assum assumptions for object, object presence, and these are some non-viable assumptions, as they are not very probable. And here's the second hand. Um, so to give you a little bit of a background, um, BMW is uh, currently uh, also working on gesture recognition in cars, and they will introduce that feature with the new BMW 7. And we thought of a way to um, make that low cost using no cameras. So BMW is currently using cameras in the infrared uh, regime. And a low cost resolution for interacting uh, with gestures in a car uh, could be that display um, where, you, oh, where you can uh, simply um, point on things and make it a bit less distracting um, to interact uh, with technology and not probably having to focus on the touchscreen itself. So now um, one can use different kinds of gestures uh, to select music, um, for example, as it is shown here. And then uh, the music will start. And um, yeah, gestures, gestures can also be used to. Uh, um, yeah, raise or decrease the volume of that music. So um, these are some exemplary trajectories uh, we recorded in front of the screen. 
Um, and here you can see that uh, rectangles are clearly distinguishable, um, L shapes or triangles or circles. And this kind of technique could be used to provide gesture recognition in cars for a cost of perhaps 10 euros. Um, so it's, it's very low cost. I also um, created some conceptual standalone devices. Um, in that case, um, it's a device that can recognize gestures, and we experimented uh, with it in different use cases and settings, for example, to control a screen application or to control uh, appliances in the environment, like this smart door. And here, um, again, the advantage is that uh, it is non-contact, but we also experienced that when people come up to a capacitive sensing device, they don't know what to do. Um, because nothing affords for, for example, touching or uh, carrying out a gesture. And therefore, we integrated this uh, LED grid underneath uh, the sensing surface um, to indicate possible gesture movements, but also to um, give feedback on interaction. Yes. So, I mean, you said people get confused if there's anything yeah. to touch and so forth. What is the advantage of having a sensor like this that is non-touch? over touch? Um, we've been, for example, investigating possibilities to open doors by non-touch because of uh, hygienic aspects. Um, so that might be a solution, but also uh, in the medical domain, when you have surgeries, uh, you don't want to touch something. Um, but there's also a case for cameras, of course. Um, but um, at some point, maybe privacy is also an issue. Um, so it's, it's mainly the hygienic aspect uh, which one might focus on. Okay, so that's the video. And now the device is telling me, okay, interact with me. And that's actually working quite well. <laughs> and now um, I'm getting feedback on my current hand position. And um, as soon as I select an image in this image view application, um, it lights up in green. And now it's telling me, okay, you can carry out swipe gestures on top of my surface. Uh, to switch between those images. So that's uh, the feedback. And uh, as soon as it lights up in green, it says, okay, I'm carrying out an action. And now it's acknowledging and now giving feed forward information. Um, so we've made the experience that uh, the different colors uh, only make sense if they're used complementary. And in that case, we have a door. Um, and the green color indicates that uh, a gesture can be carried out to open that door, and the red color uh, to close it again. So um, in that case, that's uh, the hygienic case study. The green and red things indicate? Uh, the green, green one is for opening the door, and the red one is for closing it again. Is that to tell you which way to swipe? Right. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, the hardware, and we've got 12 different capacitive sensors. Um, and transparent electrodes uh, on top of that uh, surface here. So now I covered uh, the first three dimensions, um, but I wasn't yet able to identify objects and devices or humans. And um, this is my next goal, uh, to provide mean, means for identifying things. Um, and also the spatial relationships. So here's my goal. Um, I wanted to uh, identify interaction with devices, making use of spatial relationships, like uh, very proximate distance between devices, but also um, on, for example, gestures carried out on a device itself. And also um, proximity may be established using, uh, using um, touches between two devices. And connecting them this way. And this probably um, makes the proximity uh, terminology a bit more um, pragmatic. So there are different methods of uh, providing means for communications. And uh, the first one is inductive, uh, where you use magnetic fields. Uh, the second, capacitive. And the third is based on radio frequency. And in order to support these um, proxemic interactions, 
um, I use the capacitive approach um, because it can make sense of spatial relationships um, using both interaction and messaging. Um, and it's also very suitable for ultra low power devices, which are in a region of uh, a factor of 100 compared, compared to uh, long range communications. Um, when using capacitive sensing, it is very vital to establish a common reference um, between two uh, communicating devices. In that case, uh, these, this reference is, is critical and it can be established, for example, by touching two devices um, and establishing the reference with the own body or also using a power supply uh, which provides, for example, ground reference. And in order to design applications based on capacitive near field communications, I uh, proposed a framework which um, has three different operating modes. And the first operating mode is um, ground coupling by touch, um, where one has a, a battery powered object and uh, the ground coupling is established by this ground electrode here and the transmitter electrode transmits information to appliances in the environment. Let's say, in this case, uh, a smart table. And now um, this object may communicate information about acceleration um, to that table. The second operating mode is um, ground coupling by proximity, where we have a very large ground electrode. And as soon as somebody um, moves closer to that ground electrode, uh, the communication uh, or the, the, the signal between uh, receiver and transmitter uh, increases. And this makes it possible to detect proximity uh, to objects provided by persons. The third operating mode is um, intra-body communications with a common ground. And in that case, uh, we basically have a closed loop. Uh, here's a common ground provided by two objects and uh, one can establish a communication link using a transmitter electrode and a receiver, in that case, uh, the smart lamp, which can be filled up by touching a colored area and the lamp. Is that yeah. dependent on the position of both hands? Could you, could you, could you be consistent with the position of one hand on the, on the, on the right um, before you can distinguish between different gestures? <coughs> Uh, I'm sorry. Is this for, ge it's for gesture recognition? Or yeah, it? yeah. yeah it's, it's, for, it's for recognizing if two devices have been touched at the same time. Yeah. And now, then it's possible to uh, transmit messages through the human body to that device. So does that yeah. mean in that, in that right hand example, yeah. if my hand was on the thing, uh, yeah. on the thing and your hand was on the table, it wouldn't? Right? No. It must be held hands. Right. <laughs> yeah. When we had held hands, uh, it would work, yeah. So it um, would be nice having some, some kind of business card exchange by shaking hands, right? Um, so um, that's a very, very interesting uh, operating mode for uh, doing sp or exploiting spatial relations and uh, proxemic interactions. So um, these uh, three operating modes make up my framework. And um, I will later show how to, how to use them. But first, I will uh, present a little technical setup, uh, which exemplifies how, how simple it is to uh, communicate uh, by means of uh, capacitive near field communication. So in that case, um, for a transmitter, only a single microcontroller is required. And um, this microcontroller puts a square signal um, on an electrode. So that's a very simple output pin and a 10 kilohertz uh, carrier. Uh, which enables to transmit two kilobits of information uh, using that method. Of course, this is only one way. So uh, one is not able to uh, include very sophisticated methods like CSMA, CA into communication. It's just broadcasting information in a very simple manner. But it also enables to create very uh, or a large number of interacting objects um, and uh, operating at very low power. The receiver <coughs> requires um, some additional hardware. Uh, so that's basically uh, an operational amplifier. 
and uh, there's some software running on the microcontroller an analyzing the incoming signals and decoding the messages. And in that case, that airplane can uh, transmit its in acceleration information and ID uh, to the computer here. And these are, these are two examples of uh, the hardware we created. This is a simple transmitter using a coin cell tag. It can run for ages. Um, and a transceiver, which can be connected to USB to the computer. Oh, yeah. So, capacitively, we're sending the data from the accelerometer, and you get an ID as well from the device. Yeah. Uh, presumably, you also get the proximity, right? Yeah. Uh, you, the, the, the signal strength, I guess, of the capacitive signal itself mm -hmm. gives you that, that distance. Is that right? Yeah, but it's very ambiguous. So uh, you only may detect changes, um, but not yeah, deriving a certain distance. Um, so suppose you only cover um, one third of the ground electrode when you're touching it. Um, it will induce a much, uh, much uh, less signal than uh, uh, touching the whole ground electrode with your whole hand. So um, it makes it easy to detect changes, for example, when moving it closer or moving it away or touching it in a different way, but uh, having a real proximity value is very difficult to obtain. Okay, thank you. Okay, so these are some examples. Um, here we have a lighter, and one can basically use every conductive uh, thing uh, which is already included in an object, like this lighter cap, and this one is used for transmitting, <coughs> and it, it can even transmit when the lighter is on, uh, which is very neat. Um, and here's the ground electrode, which is usually touched um, to establish this kind of common reference. Another example is uh, some aluminum tape, which is attached to the table, uh, which can act as a receiver for uh, a laptop for tangible objects. And this one also uh, allows for different operating modes like ground coupling by proximity, touch, and intra-body communications. This is an example of a magnifying glass, um, which can be used uh, in combination with the desk uh, to sense proximity to it. And as soon as I hover over that magnifying glass, it can be located, and then I can say, okay, here's the glass, I find it. So um, we implemented that for, as a proof of concept for blind people, which I will show later. And this is an example of a smartwatch. Um, that's a bit of a different setup because uh, that's not so much um, tangible interaction, but we use that in combination with a bat, uh, having some uh, conductive wires inside um, to show that it's possible to do very low power uh, communications of acceleration data, for example, to analyze sleeping behavior. And in that case, we have a transmit electrode here and a ground electrode located here. So where would the receiver be in that case? That's uh, on, the, on the bat sheet. Yeah, so there's conductive fabric inside, and uh, it can basically receive the messages of multiple watches. Then. Yeah. So I could imagine having that at much, much smaller scales um, integrated into uh, normal smart textiles uh, to do sleeping behavior studies. <coughs> Okay, so um, I evaluated all these different operating modes, and um, the key findings are that, uh, of course, bigger transmit and receive electrodes uh, allow for greater communication ranges. In that case, having a three by three centimeters patch allows for communicating in distances of 15 centimeters. Also, larger transmit electrodes are better than large receive electrodes. Um, which is a bit of a pity because when we have um, like small objects, um, yeah, we, we can't enlarge this electrode uh, as we would like to, but it's usually easier to enlarge receive electrodes when you're operating with objects that are a bit more sophisticated, like this bed or the table, which uh, provides yeah, just more space to deploy electrodes. Um, 
When using large ground electrodes, one can detect distances up to 15 centimeters when hovering over the object. And also when using intra-body communication, uh, it is possible to recognize changes in contact area. So when I couple two devices with each other, I can sense whether I remove or add fingers, for example, um, which I could be exploited to, to make things a bit more interactive. Um, for example, by having different strengths of uh, spatial relationships. So that is a case study we made for blind people um, in cooperation with the company. And they are having these uh, braille cards that can carry out certain commands uh, so that people um, don't need to uh, use a keyboard and uh, learn all the difficult uh, shortcuts. And in that case, that braille card carries out the command of uh, reading the screen content. And uh, the airplane was used to uh, control the speed of the screen reader. And here one can launch different applications using that cube, like email client or uh, online banking, <coughs> for example. And uh, this is an example of the magnifying glass. Uh, you can see me hovering over it. And then, then there will be a textual description on what it does. And then I can use the magnifying glass to uh, browse through the screen and uh, yeah, read, for example, some contents. So that's a very conceptual study. Um, but I think it could show how blind people can uh, or could interact with a computer in the future using tangible objects. And the last proxemic interaction dimension I would like to cover is location. And um, I started my work by um, creating a smart couch using capacitive sensing. And this smart couch is able to uh, recognize um, nine different postures and then adjust the environment, for example, uh, turning on music uh, when somebody lies down or uh, yeah, switching off the light um, to make it, make it more relaxing. We could show with uh, nine training persons and nine test persons that uh, the recognition performance is very good at 97.5%. The second example I would like to show is uh, CapFlow. And this has been a project I've been working on uh, since uh, I started my PhD. And it's uh, an industrial project uh, which is supposed to be used in smart homes to localize persons and also to recognize falls, uh, especially in elderly homes. And here we can, we can see a setup of CapFloor. Um, we have wires deployed underneath uh, the floor. In that case, that's uh, wooden flooring. And we have sensors uh, right at the walls that are connected to these wires. And this basically makes up a giant touch screen. Um, and there's... Uh, a subsystem controller accumulating all the sensor values and then sending them over to the dispatcher box, um, which is located in the apartment. And approximately one year ago, or a bit more, um, we got our first uh, assignment on uh, deploying CapFloor in an elderly home. And we've been doing that in, in uh, 23 apartments with uh, 1,600 square meters. Um, deploying all these wires. Um, of course, in the future, we would like to have some, some kind of sheet which can be rolled out uh, to make it more convenient uh, to, to place these wires underneath the floor. And then the sensors will be placed right here at the walls, uh, aside uh, the wooden flooring. Was it just you that did 1,000 square meters? No, we had, a, we had many, many students working on that. Um, so... Yeah, it was uh, tough work, and also the uh, workers on the construction side weren't very cooperative, uh, doing things different. Um, so, uh, yeah, they basically destroyed uh, some installations, and we had to clean up beer bottles and cigarettes, and um, it was, uh, that was very tough, actually. <laughs> so um, then we got a water leakage, and we had to do that twice. Uh, because they had to remove the whole flooring 
And um, that was a, a huge catastrophe because all the elderly uh, already had uh, canceled their contracts uh, for apartments. And so they had to move to their children. And uh, yeah, that was uh, very serious, actually. So um, these are uh, the sensors I developed. Um, they are all attached to this kind of ribbon cable uh, in an array. Um, yeah, composition. So every 20 centimeters, you would have such such a sensor. But in our current iteration, uh, we only have a sensor every 40 centimeters, uh, where one can connect two electrodes uh, to make it a bit less expensive and also to have less uh, technical failures. And this is how it looks like uh, when being placed uh, aside the wooden flooring. That's uh, about one centimeter, and we require spacing of 1.5 to 2 centimeters here. Um, and here's the cable that runs into the room, and then the flatband cable is uh, connected across that line. Um, in order to analyze data, um, we developed a main controller um, that is placed in the dispatcher box, and um, this main controller has a Texas Instruments BeagleBone uh, on top of it, um, running all the applications and doing all the signal processing. And uh, this peripheral board was designed by ourselves, um, having bus connections and bus drivers, and also um, dispatching all the communication lines uh, to these uh, connectors. And yeah, as I said, this um, controller is then being placed uh, inside each apartment. There's also some uh, software related uh, to CapFloor. Um, this is the CapFloor Designer, where you have a ground plan, and uh, one can simply drag and drop sensors from here and place them into a room, and then uh, use a live view to uh, analyze the signals and see where persons have been located and where faults have been recognized. So that's what it looks like from a technical uh, viewpoint. And uh, we also got an app for caregivers, um, which notifies caregivers uh, when a fall has been recognized. In that case, uh, this message has been distributed to uh, four or five caregivers, and the one wins, uh, which presses accept, and then the caregiver has to uh, take care of that. Um, this is an example of uh, data provided by CapFloor. Um, in that case, uh, one can see uh, two uh, data sources. One is a fall recognition, uh, which does a bit more signal processing. And here you can see a person uh, stepping over the floor um, from the top. And now um, we can observe a fall. So that's shown here. And we basically analyze the area um, which is being uh, covered by the person then. And that's uh, the second fall. So I want to quickly wrap up uh, my talk. Um, I've, I'm, I'm going to talk about a bit about future work, of course, uh, in a few minutes. So. Um, I've covered the, three, uh, the five different proxemic interaction dimensions, uh, distance, orientation, and movement, identity, and location, uh, using different scientific contributions, um, and also some industrial projects I've been working on. And um, I want to quickly also go into the future of capacitive sensing. So currently, um, I've always used uh, an actively generated electric potential. Well, that's very similar to, to ultrasound, where you, where you kind of transmit a signal, wait for its return. Um, but you could also just listen. And um, that has been done by various researchers, also um, by a sensors and devices group. Um, and combining that um, could lead to very interesting developments, like, for example, low power messaging between objects. Um, greater detection distances of two to three meters, um, higher expressiveness when interacting with objects, uh, monitoring of vital signs like ECGs, 
and a greater energy efficiency by the factor of, I, I think, like 50 uh, when you have uh, current commercial products. Um, I would also like to investigate uh, passive piezo-based interaction tags, which are, spa which, which are uh, placed a bit away from the sensor itself, um, but still being able to, to measure interactions. A second thing I've been doing was to equip physical objects with capacitive communications. But now, when we move to the domain of virtual objects, um, this hasn't been done so far. And this could, for example, allow to build smarter touchscreens uh, that have a better support for tangible objects um, and can also um, lead to uh, through-body data transitions, as it has been shown with cameras in Microsoft Research. And I want to quickly step into that and show an example of what I mean by a smarter touchscreen. So in that case, um, we want to uh, transfer an image from one source to the other um, by simply touching those two sources. In that case, um, the image is uh, transmitted from the tablet PC um, to the smartphone. And this actually makes, makes use of the spatial relationships. So whenever one touches that image, it will make a difference than touching this one. So data can be encoded locally on a, smart, on a, on a touch screen to um, be transmitted by intra-body communications. Yeah. Would that be an infrastructure of electrodes in the, in the environment? Yeah. But, but you already have it because it's already there. So, um, yeah, it's, it's basically the same infrastructure, but the hardware needs to be changed. You mean the infrastructure being the touchscreen itself? Yeah, right. No, environment, no new environmental. Yeah. yeah, you don't need to put like electrodes on the table. No. Okay. No. Okay, another thing which will be interesting is to transfer information by device hovering. Um, for example, again, I want to transfer this image uh, to the mobile phone. Now I can simply hover over it and transfer the information also by the spatial relationship that I'm placing it right here. Um, another thing that is also interesting, but is a bit of a different domain, but it's also possible, um, is to sense biometrics, um, for example, by sensing a two-lead finger ECG right on the, on the touch screen. And this could be used, uh, for example, to identify persons or monitoring their vital signs. Um, and currently, we, we see a lot of developments in related work um, which apply smartwatches uh, to communicate with the touch screen. And they basically fake touch events. Um, but this faking comes with the cost that one needs to apply really high voltages of 100 volts, uh, which just trick this on the, the touchscreen controller. But the controller could do more. Um, but we're currently just not having the techniques to do so. Can I just ask, so that yeah. first one, you're talking about not wearing anything. That log on by, by biometrics somehow passively takes some, some bodily reading, doesn't it? Right. And have you done any work to see, or I guess the plan is to do this work to see how, how much you can distinguish people? Yeah, I, I, there, there have been some, some works on uh, impedance sensing to distinguish people, but that's very coarse. You can't call that biometrics. It's more like uh, identifying, let's say, 10 or 5 persons. Um, from, from a known set. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there have been works on that. Um, but I also think that ECG sensing might be very interesting. Perhaps also to distinguish between persons touching in a multiple, a multi-touch or multiple person environment. So yeah, this is um, one aspect um, I'm, I would consider uh, interesting to investigate and it definitely requires uh, some, some scientific discussions. And um, yeah, I thank you very much for your time and um, looking forward for some questions. Um, so we're right on the top of the hour, but I think that I don't see anyone um, desperate to get in the room. So, and we've had quite a few questions through the presentation, but if there are one or two questions now, yeah. Ken. I've got one that was taking up the whole time. Like, almost everything you've done 
there are people trying to do similar things with depth cameras and various right. sort of visual techniques. Yeah. Now, you've made the clear point that this is way lower cost and way lower power generally. Yeah. But have you thought about combining the two? Because I can imagine, you know, the sort of depth camera kind of sort of approaches, they're still, you know, they're not, they're not, they're still not perfect. And I think yeah. just throwing few, the sort of extra signals you have into the machine learning in yeah. infrastructure might really help. Have you thought about that or right. tried that? Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, for example, uh, let's suppose you have some wall-sized displays. Uh, you got your problem with the angle of view uh, of your camera. So uh, the one could be for very close interactions, also using through body transitions and all these kinds of things. And cameras could really enhance the interaction distance there. And uh, of course, uh, cameras have a much greater bandwidth and they can provide much more information than capacitive sensing can do. Um, so combination of both is, is definitely interesting. And um, yeah, I've, I've seen some, some uh, works, for example, on, on tablet PCs where they use uh, capacitively tagged uh, tangible objects which are recognized by the smartphone and then have also uh, uh, a visual tag on them which can be detected by the camera. So you can uh, basically have these two steps like touch and uh, yeah, a great interaction distance. So, um, yeah, I think um, that's these, these two things like tiny interaction distance, angle of view on cameras, these can be combined very, very nicely. Um, and also to perhaps to provide some greater reliability when, when having camera based uh, uh, applications, yeah. Let's say in a car. I mean, I guess, yeah, the, the BMW scenario you talked about, yeah. there's an issue with optical systems in cars, I guess, because of the Right, yeah. When sunlight. you have sunlight coming in, it's, uh, it's going to be really difficult. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned the thing about BMW. So is BMW actually using a capacitive sensing now? Um, or is that they're they're the using it for the rooftop uh, to, to control it, yeah. But uh, I, I think that this is not going into uh, uh, production right now. So that was uh, shown on IAA. Um, but on the BMW 7, uh, the gesture recognition with cameras is going into production in, 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 by the end of July. And I mean, I had a, a, a kind of question about the, uh, the installation that you showed in the care home, right? So that is that that's still up and running. Is is that right? Yeah, that's. Are they uh, that's using? Is it being used sort of daily? How does are they running your software to detect falls? Are they? Yeah. Um, since we had that water leakage, everything got delayed. So um, currently, what we've been doing is to equip one e apartment, taking taking and recording test data, and um, now we went into a second hardware iteration because we had some problems with uh, noise provided by uh, these cathode TVs. Um, so, uh, yeah, now we're planning to, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> the CR, the CRP we can't TVs, force right? everyone to buy a 4K TV, so, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. But, the, and there's a company who's, uh, who kind of running that, how does, uh, there's, uh, an investor running that house and, uh, they have, uh, so, and the way people live, there's, uh, there's a community down there for dementia patients. There are 14 dementia patients, and we've uh, equipped um, all of the rooms with ca uh, capacitive sensing, but, but, but just with the electrodes. So there's uh, not yet a system connected. And now we're having one very nice old lady, and where we always go into the apartment and say, okay, we need to do some more tests and we need to record situations and uh, she, yeah, she's, she's really supporting us and uh, that's, um, that's very nice. Yeah. So uh, I have a question kind of just about cap capacitive sensing in general. I mean, so a lot of the things you're describing mm -hmm. are, are nice because they can be very intuitive but at the same time um, the fact that the sensor can't be seen or can be hidden. Um, I mean so for example like the, the floor thing, the idea that I could walk into a room and not know that all of my actions within that room are being tracked, mm -hmm. um, and that maybe I, you know, that and that the things I touch, it just seems. I mean, are there? Do you feel that there's privacy concerns, yes. um, or, or uh, you know, that there's that there, there needs to be a way in which kind of the ability of sensing or that or that um, you know the presence of sensors should be communicated to people? Yeah, 
definitely there, there are privacy concerns. Uh, they're probably not as strong as when using cameras. So uh, we have these uh, live logging cameras where uh, some people go on the toilet and uh, people start complaining, okay, he's wearing this camera. So uh, that's a bit of a very intrusive also to other people. And especially when you have visitors who don't know that every step is recorded. Uh, that could be a problem, yeah. Um, we're trying, always trying to tell uh, people that all the data remains in the apartment. Um, of course, currently, there's a big downstream to our institute uh, to have all the data recorded. Um, but in the meantime, we would, or in the future, we would like to have it all in the apartment and nothing going on. But that's also the problem when you put up a camera and say, okay, it's only doing gesture recognition and the data has been abstracted at some point, uh, people still feel uh, that they might be kind of observed. So that's a, that's a very difficult consideration. Okay. Well, let's uh, thank our speaker one more time. Thank you. Thank you.